Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Philip Tenari, director of UCCA Center for Contemporary Art here in Beijing. And it's my pleasure to take you on a walkthrough of our latest exhibition, Becoming Andy Warhol, uh, presented in collaboration with the Andy Warhol Museum, one of the Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh, curated by Warhol Museum director Patrick Moore and chief curator Jose Carlos Diaz. Here we go. So as we started to think about what kind of Warhol exhibition made sense for Beijing in the year 2021, uh, we were informed by a much larger conversation that's been going on in the scholarship around Warhol. And that really has, I think, its roots and its crystallization in, in, in two recent uh, pieces of cultural output. One is the 2018 exhibition, Andy Warhol from A to B and Back Again, that happened at the Whitney Museum of American Art and subsequently toured. Um, the other is a, is a biography by Blake Gopnik that came out uh, last year just called Warhol. And I think both of these have really pushed us to think about Warhol's life and his work in a more holistic light than we uh, had before. Um, of course, given the tenor of the current conversation, they're able to more forthrightly address things like Warhol's sexuality and his identity and how key these were to his whole conception of himself and his world. But also, I think, you know, as the debates between high and low um, have faded into memory and you know, postmodernism itself is even a thing of the past, we're now able to look for new kinds of connections uh, that span his entire creative output. And by that I mean you know, beginning in 1949 when he leaves Pittsburgh and moves to New York and ending of course when he uh, dies prematurely uh, in 1987. And so in each of these decades we see him doing different things but we also see these different things connecting in new ways. So that's sort of the, the academic background. Um, we also were very conscious of the fact that when you do a show like this in China, often people know the name and maybe a few key works, but they don't have a full sense. They haven't had a chance to experience the breadth of the uh, creative you know, process of, of a given artist. Um, and we're very grateful to the Warhol Museum with its incredibly rich collection, not only of artworks, but of archives, uh, for coming up with the presentation of nearly 400 objects and images that that really speaks to this, um, this fullness. So we're standing here in the first section of the exhibition, which is called Origins. And this is really looking at Warhol's time in Pittsburgh. Um, he was born, of course, in 1928. Um, he went to high school there. He grew up in a Byzantine Catholic family, um, surrounded by people from you know, modern day Slovakia. Um, and really in one of the great industrial cities of the American um, 20th century, full of pollution, full of low cost labor coming from mostly Southern and Eastern Europe, um, and full of possibility. So we see here, you know, things from his, his upbringing, his high school yearbook, for example, and portraits. Um, he started, of course, to study art very early on uh, at the Carnegie Museum, in fact, um, and then to enroll in what's now Carnegie Mellon, uh, not then called the Carnegie Institute of Technology, I believe. Uh, where he studied um, basically design and, and draftsmanship. One really interesting body of work here is uh, a set of drawings that he made in the summer of 1946, towards the beginning of his studies. I think in the first year, maybe like a lot of us, wasn't such a great student. Um, and his teachers told him he really needed to get his act together. And so this, this set of drawings um, of of the sort of produce uh, situation in, in Pittsburgh at the time, deliveries of, of food, uh, just ordinary things happening, street scenes. You, you, you get a glimpse of his observational uh, and figurational ideas. So anyway, that's the beginning of our exhibition. And then we move into a section that's really talking much more about you know, how he be starts And of course, the whole theme of this exhibition, Becoming Andy Warhol, is, is sort of how this person became this persona or this figure. Um, and so, you know, this begins even in his Pittsburgh years, summer jobs he took um, at the Joseph Horn department store, working on visual merchandising, uh, adventures he had with classmates, including Philip Perlstein, um, sort of starting to experience uh, avant-garde art even through a, a gallery that was then active in Pittsburgh but always still thinking about his, his future and where that might lead him. And so when we come into this room, we're really starting to see the early uh, New York work, basically things that were happening in the 50s. Um, we've decided to really center his mother, Julia Warhola, um, herself an immigrant, um, 
but also you know, a lifelong companion and, and collaborator. Uh, people may not realize that the, the early commercial work that he did in the 50s often featured lettering that was actually done by his mother. Um, and I think the figure of his mother is super important given her accent and her uh, kind of old world manner as various authors have pointed out. I think there's a tendency to think that she didn't really know quite what her son was up to in many different respects. Um, and yet there are other commentators more recently who've been talking a lot about how she probably knew you know, who he was, what his import was, uh, what his contribution was, what his lifestyle was. Um, so that, that was something we, we were really excited to, to put there. And you have these wonderful drawings you know, that he made of, of cats. This is the period when he's living on the Upper East Side and he's becoming quite a prominent commercial illustrator. Um, these done, of course, by his mother. Um, but you, you start to see this, this collaboration unfold and this, this dialogue. And as we, as we come to this next room, we really start to see uh, his commercial work kind of in its fullest blossom. And this is, this is a body of work that people do know a bit. You know, most famously, drawings of shoes uh, that were commissioned as advertisements by, by different retailers uh, that feature this blotted line uh, technique that involves a, a sort of transfer through paper uh, and then coloring. Um, famously shoes, Christmas cards. We also have kind of an interesting item. These are recent replications of windows that he did for Bonwit Teller, uh, the, the famous department store on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan that in, actually in the 80s was torn down to make way for Trump Tower. I, I have this pet theory that without Warhol there would be no Trump. And this is, um, this is maybe the first uh, piece of, of evidence for that. But of course, Bonwit Teller in the 50s, um, with its famous virtual, visual merchandising department, was a home for artists like also including Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg and a number of others who were finding their way. And it's just kind of great to see the sorts of things he was thinking about then. Um, so anyway, we, we really hoped to be able to take that kind of work seriously and to put it in the larger context of what happened when in the early 1960s he made this switch to fine art, um, which I think a lot of us would like to argue is didn't come from nowhere. So another way that we've tried to stress different aspects of Warhol's life, work, and output is through a focus on media that he was involved with his whole life, but which are maybe not seen as his most important bodies of work. Uh, specifically photography, which is this purple section, and film, which is the silver section represented by this uh, canopy above us showing screen tests and other films, and then by these silver walls in the middle. So we'll start with photography. Um, Warhol was an obsessive photographer. He constantly made images. Um, he, 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 he carried his Polaroid big shot around to all kinds of different events. Um, and in this, in this gallery here, we really see photography as kind of everyday life. So as he, in the 60s and 70s, becomes this famous artist and he's running in these quite elevated circles, he's around people like Henry Kissinger, like Elizabeth Taylor, uh, like Cher, uh, Liza Minnelli, Bianca Jagger, John Lennon, you know, the list goes Jerry Hall, the list goes on and on and on. Um, but we see these really fun pictures that he made with them or that friends of his made of him with these people. Um, the photographic record being something that he was just so interested in and something that he really left behind. And also uh, a space in which he could work out other ideas and innovate, but also document. Um, and so I, I just love this room. If you go through, which unfortunately we don't have time to go to every single image, but you see really a who's who of, of this kind of late 20th century American uh, New York cultural scene. And one thing that's kind of fun too is that you have this connection and you have this in every gallery of kind of looking from your immediate surroundings up. And as I should mention, our exhibition designed by Xiao Xi Chen Laurent, an incredible exhibition designer based in New York. Um, you look up and you suddenly see these figures in the screen test staring back down at you in the gallery. You know, these the famous three minute reels that he made of his friends and collaborators and heroes and subjects. Um, on the other side of this section, we actually see a different 
aspect of Warhol as photographer. This is, this is really where we're looking more at actually some of the more formal innovations or experimentations he did in photography. And maybe the most important thing to stress here are these stitched photos, which is a, not a very well known body of work of his. Um, so these are mostly made towards the very end of his life. These are most of these works on these easels are from 1986. And you see this four square repetition, you know, something that people who know Warhol's paintings uh, might be very f familiar with. And this very kind of handmade way of bringing the images together. This image in particular is interesting for this context because this is actually an image of the uh, Beijing uh, number one department store, which uh, is located in the center of the city and was a place that Warhol had his picture taken when he visited Beijing in 1982. But we also see images of, of scenes from North America and, and from elsewhere. Um, on this wall, we see a lot of his more experimental Polaroids. And it's fun because we start to see elements you know, that are prominent throughout his creations, like shoes, which we just talked about, um, or Easter eggs kind of explored for their formal properties. And again, this happens at many different points along the way. And that's really what we're exploring in, in this gallery. So while we're on this kind of um, lens-based uh, thread, we come to the, the, this middle section, which is called cinema as object. And we know that Warhol you know, was actually also one of the leading experimental filmmakers of his generation. And we've tried to get that across the audience. Um, on these walls, you have a lot of images that sort of document his filmic production. Some of them by people like you know, Stephen Shore, the, uh, the, the photographer who came to the factory as, a, as an 18 year old and goes on to be one of America's leading photographers. Um, so we're, we're getting a sense of, of this kind of ongoing process of filmmaking that happens. There's scripts that are written by, by collaborators. Um, there are ideas that get turned into reality. This is all very much revolving around the Silver Factory, you know, the studio that he inhabited in Midtown Manhattan in, in the 60s. Um, of course, again, the most famous body of these works are these screen tests, uh, which we see above us. And then on either end, we actually see uh, two of his most important experimental films. The first one, Sleep, which just documents his friend and, and par then briefly partner, Jean Giorno, asleep for six hours. Um, and then on the other side, we have Empire, uh, the famous you know, unmoving eight hour shot of the Empire State Building from, from the window of a nearby building. We also have a few of his cameras around and even some of his later experiments in television production that happened in, in the 80s as well. So that's, that's cinema as object. Um, let's, let's continue. We can now look at what I think is a really key section of the exhibition. And here we're really getting into Warhol's um, work as a painter. So we, we start to see some of this, this key output from, from the 60s. Uh, these, these two very rare and important self-portraits. This one based on a, on a set of photos he made in a, in a photo booth in, in 1963 as he's coming into his own uh, as this, this figure you know, wearing his sunglasses and his crooked tie. Um, we start to understand Warhol as a, a persona, a figure who was very much interested in self-projection and, and self-creation. Uh, and that that process is happening at the same time as some of his most famous artistic output, like the flowers, you know, which, he, which he first showed in 1984, uh, which is maybe one of the best examples of you know, the standard reading of pop, pop as a kind of ongoing process of mechanical reproduction. But then I mean, one of the really brilliant things about this show for me is that you're always jumping around in time. Um, so, you know, like I said, paintings from 1964. This sequence is from 1982, and it's really showing the process of the creation of a portrait of Jane Fonda. So from the Polaroid to the blow up, to the acetate, to the final silk screen, uh, to the final painting. Um, and we kind of see this, this, how this machine is working and how he's processing images and making them into into painting. And, and we see a number of examples, and that's really what one place we've been able to very successfully draw in the Warhol's collection. Um, the sim a similar process here with Liza Minnelli as well. And we can, we can start to understand, you know, that there's, there's intentionality behind each of these images. Uh, there's actually a lot more handcraft than, than people might think at first glance. Um, and ultimately, you know, an icon is, is also, you know, is 
to use his own phrase, something deeply superficial. Um, and this, this exploration continues in the other half of this section, um, where we see really some of the, the later, later portraiture. Um, some of these done for, uh, as commissions for hire. This is actually, of course, how, why he came to Hong Kong when he did in 1982, was with the idea of making portraits of society figures there. Uh, but still, you know, figures like Martha Graham, uh, various Hollywood stars and others. So we're, we're, we're getting a chance to explore his relation to portraiture. And then as we continue along, we come to a section that I think is in a way one of the highlights of the exhibition and we call this Warhol Remixed. And a bit as I was just saying, this idea of jumping back and forth in time, um, we start to see elements that occur and recur. So I think this juxtaposition really says it all. You know, in 1961, this painting of, of a Coke bottle, you know, this is actually even before he starts to use silkscreen technique. This is, this is purely uh, an acrylic on, uh, on, on, on linen painting. Um, and then we fast forward to 1985, you know, his, his original Coke bottles have long come and gone. Uh, you know, Coke has released the new Coke. It's kind of this famously failed experiment in the history of American marketing. And Warhol, you know, towards the end of his life and career, uh, makes a, a series of, of screen prints actually looking at the iconography of new Coke. And of course, we've juxtaposed that with, you know, this view light projector that he would have used in the very early days to, to help him uh, create images, and even uh, a photograph that he made in 19... Um, 82 of, of, of Coke bottles, you know, just down on the, on the street. And this all kind of continues. So here we have another similar juxtaposition. This is an early um, Campbell's Soup Can Ensemble um, coming from 1969. So slightly later, I think the, the first was 1963, but this is from, the, from that first burst of, of, of soup. Um, and then we, we juxtapose that with, you know, new Campbell's packaging from the 80s um, uh, along with these other paintings as well. So this is, this is the remix. These are boxes from, from that important uh, Castelli show of, of the boxes that happened in, in 1964 as well. And, and of course, Marilyn is present. Um, so we, we, we start here to see some of these, these key images and icons that, that so fascinated him. Um, at, the, at that moment of real breakthrough in his career, and that, but that also remained with him throughout the rest of his, uh, of his days. And then there's another part of the section where we're actually looking at something I think is quite ironic because, of course, he begins his, his fine art career appropriating and exploring um, commercial icons. Well, before that, he's creating commercial icons as a commercial illustrator. When we get to the 80s, he starts actually to take advertisements for these products as his inspiration and to do all kinds of things with them. So here we have you know, a very important ad for, for Chanel number no. five perfume. Um, here we have a, a body of work around uh, Cadillac automobiles. You also see Absolute Vodka, Perrier, Macintosh, Levi Strauss. Ironically, all brands that are still alive and well all these years later. Um, but these are, are later works that are kind of, uh, as we say, remixing this um, pop sensibility and this special attitude towards the iconicity of, of different kinds of advertising. And then we come finally to this last section, which is called the immaterial. And I think the real inspiration for this, this section comes from a recent show at the Warhol Museum, which which specifically explored Warhol's religious sensibility. Um, of course, he was, he was famously shot in 1968 and, and suffered health issues you know, for the last two decades of his life. But especially as we get into the late 70s and early 80s, we see all kinds of explorations of what it means to be alive and, and what it means to face one's certain death. Uh, and most iconically, the, the fright wig paintings um, are often talked about in those terms. But we also see you know, these other interests surfacing. So you know, Warhol was never 
interested in abstraction, right? He comes from the moment after abstract expressionism and is trying to find new strategies for art. But I think it was sort of an intellectual puzzle for him. Are there images that can be at once abstract and concrete? And the answer he came up with was camouflage and Rorschach ink blots. So we see these bodies of work that explore those two subjects. And then we get to just iconography that would be very well known from a, a, the perspective of religious or, or Catholic art, uh, the sacred heart, right? I mean, this is something that occurs again and again um, in, in, in Catholic art or, or the skull, you know, the, the quintessential memento mori. And when you think that these are happening, you know, in, towards the end of his career, it makes it sort of all the more meaningful. But there's also this sort of reprocessing of what he's been interested in all along. And that's something you see, for example, in this myth series, which takes all these different figures from the American experience, including the artist himself, but also Uncle Sam and Santa Claus and Howdy Doody and others, and coats them in this diamond dust. Um, and then you see, you know, things like this, 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 this body of self-portraiture from, from the 70s as well, where he's appearing multiply at, at the same time. Always this constant process of iteration, creation, projection, performance, embodiment. Um, and you also see an icon that was very dear to him, the dollar sign. So... Anyway, we, we, we decided to end the show on this note of later Warhol, uh, work that people may be less familiar with, but that we thought was still just very important to understanding his, his overall perspective and position and importance and contribution to, to global art history. So that's, that's the exhibition. I guess I'll just end by saying, you know, it's, it's really an interesting thing to be doing a show of Warhol in, in Beijing at this moment. We opened the exhibition actually the day after the 100th anniversary of the, of the Chinese Communist Party, um, which seems a little bit ironic when you consider you know, Warhol as, as an artist who, as these Washington Monument uh, wallpaper would show, was quintessentially American and also so interested in capitalism and all its manipulations and machinations. Um, but I think there's, there's something about the Warholian project that's highly relevant to people in China today. Um, on, on a number of levels, you know, in the, in the 90s, when contemporary Chinese art really started to, to take off, there was actually a, a movement called political pop of artists who were using kind of pop iconography uh, juxtaposed with kind of Chinese political iconography and, and international brands. And that's one kind of, a, of an influence or a fusion. But I think even more than that, as we get to the, you know, into, well into the 21st century, and we're inundated with you know, algorithmic feeds um, and, and all kinds of information, this idea of self-creation and, and self-projection is one that resonates uh, very deeply with, with the public here. So the museum's closed today. That's why uh, we had the place to ourselves and could look at the works in the way we did. Should you come here while the show is open, and I hope you will if you happen to be in, in Beijing or in Shanghai where the show will travel uh, in November, um, you'd see hundreds of mainly quite young, uh, quite urban Chinese viewers looking to make sense of themselves and, and their world through, through these works that we've brought here. And I think that's, um, in the end, what, what this is all about, why we do a show like this, and, and why we hope uh, we'll, we'll see you the next time we do one. So thank you, everyone.